and not doing anything with this, right? Uh, you're going to take off. You don't need to know anything about that. You're going that. to take off. Yeah, I'll, t I'll tell you about it. <laughs> so, um, so right now, like right here, just hold it, hold it right there. Hold it, feel the, feel the weight of it. Go ahead, hold it right there. So that's about like level. And then what we'll do is uh, we'll get to like 85 or 90 knots, and you just want to kind of just like, right there, not real small inputs, like real smooth is good. And so you want to come from like here and just kind of like fly the airplane off the ground a little bit, just okay. a little bit of back stick. And then if we see like a ton of sky, like we're going way up, just nice and easy, just don't push it, but just kind of release some some of the I, pressure. No, I, I don't would, even drive a car, right? I, I would just like to vote that. Like you don't should. drive a car? No. No. She really She's a terrible like, driver. No. For real? Yeah. 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 For real. Yeah. She, she, the last time she got in an accident, she hit a parked car at a traffic light. Oh. So. It was a police car. That was the worst part. Oh. Well, we'll be, we'll be okay. Um, but you are going to take off. So, um, so what I'm talking about, we'll, we'll kind of just, we'll get on the runway here. Uh, hold up. Mount Pleasant Traffic, TBM 975, Charlie Alpha, taking runway 35 for departure will be to the, uh, departure of the northeast, Mount Pleasant. All right. So, nobody around, so... This is an uncontrolled airport, so I don't have to talk to anybody, no tower, anything like that. So we're just kind of looking around, making sure that nobody is like failing to call and going to run into us. And then it's a pretty short runway, so we'll, um, normally I might do like a rolling takeoff or something, but we'll just kind of get set up here. Okay, so your feet uh, control the heading. I'll help you with that. And you, man, you do this, okay? So you hold on to this. There you go. You ready? Okay, so I'm going to put my heels to the deck and we're going to take off. So about 85 knots will rotate the nose. And just very slowly. We will or you will? You will. You will. You will. No, you will do it. It's fine. So just slowly rotate the nose, okay? You got it. Just hold it right there. Nice and easy. Not, not, too, not too tight. You don't need to like, grip it really hard. Don't freak out. To try to loosen up a little bit. Um, that's the thing is like a lot of people get really tense. All right. So here we go. Power's coming in. I'm looking for 100% torque. So we're rolling. There we go. A little bit of right pedal to keep us on the center line. Nice. Hey, okay, there's 60 knots, 100% torque. Everything looks good. So a little bit forward, a little bit more forward. There we go. Hold it right there. That's good. Coming off the deck a little early. Okay, a little bit of back stick. Pull it up. Pull it up. Pull it up. There you go. Just hold it right there. Now a little bit. Take a little bit out. That's too much. Like right there. You just feel that? Oh, yeah. Hold it right there. Okay. Everything looks good. Two positive rates to climb. Gears coming up. Nurse separator's coming off. A little bit less. Take a little bit out. A little bit nose over. There you go. So don't, don't forget to look outside. It's really pretty. All right. There you go. Nice job. Flaps are coming up. So now you're now you're descending. So don't forget to look outside. Look out front. You're still flying. There you go. A little you. bit of nose up. Yaw dampers coming on. So try try to turn it a little bit. Just you know, just drive it. Drive it like a car. You're turning right. Turn left. Oh my God. Turn no, left. No, no, no. Turn no, no, no. left. No, no, no. Just straighten it out a little bit. There you go. There's some big towers over there, so we want to run into those. Can't okay. tell if you're kidding with me or being serious. Not, like, I'm not touching <laughs> it. So, um, so you fly. So just, I don't want to just fly. try, try, turn I a little bit. I just wanted to be the passenger. Okay, I never had well, any desire to fly. Okay, this. well I'll take the controls then. Okay, great. <laughs> you, you don't like it? No. Not at all. Okay. No. All right, cool. Sumter County, Sumter Alpha, turning left face, two three, something. That's so funny. <laughs> you don't like it? No. 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 Okay. Uh -oh. well, that, you know, I, I don't want to force you to do something you don't want to do. I so appreciate you being willing to show me that. No, thank you. No, you well, you'll, you'll land, so that'll be the next step. So. <laughs> oh my God. All right, uh, let's see, what's it called? Oh, Mount, Mount Pleasant Traffic, TBM 975, Charlie Alpha, clear to the northeast, Mount Pleasant. So beautiful up here, seriously. Awesome. What a pretty day, like it's a perfect day. Yeah, this is nice. What I love up here is seeing all these little... Inlets. And yeah, isn't it something? It's really beautiful. Um, okay, so uh, who are you and what are you doing in my airplane today? Barry Bumgardner, and I'm actually wondering that exact same thing. <laughs> Well, after the takeoff, uh, <laughs> it was pretty obvious you might not want to actually fly. You just yeah, want to I was telling you, like, I'm known for being a terrible driver, and I'm thinking if you're not good at driving a car, you're probably not going to be good at driving a plane. Well, the cool thing about flying a plane, though, is that out here, there's not a lot of traffic, and there's really not a lot of things with the right instructor next to you that you could really do wrong that, that I couldn't I correct it's from. it's the tipping thing. Yeah. Yeah, that feeling of, like, tipping. The minute we did that, I'm like, and I'm out. And you're I'm in control. Like, <laughs> like you're, you, if you know you're in control... Just okay. Well, <laughs> I fly and you talk. So um, I'm really good at live events. That we could talk about. Driving, really good at live events. Yeah, high ticket offers and live Thank events. You, I'm your gal. Driving the plane, probably not. Hopefully, okay. we won't have to rely on us if anything happens to you. Yeah, absolutely. So maybe you could talk through like uh, what you do now and some of your success, and then maybe we'll go back a little bit to kind of your your background and where you came from before that. 
generally help people design high ticket offers so they can add a zero to their bottom line or two or three more um, through the power of a virtual live event. But what is a high ticket offer? Like a lot of people are watching this probably don't know what that is. That's such a great question. High ticket offer is any kind of coaching, consulting, program, product, or service generally over $5,000 or more. I think high ticket is 5,000 or more because that's the point where people can't just make a quick, easy decision. Most people are gonna take a minute to think about it, which is why a virtual live event comes into play. It gives them the time and the space to actually be ready for the high ticket offer and then make a decision on the high ticket offer. Got it, so people you know, do selling information or coaching programs that are expensive, like annual or one-time investments for people over $5,000. Yeah, and I often look at it like anything you're really good at. Think of like your zone of genius, something that you figured out, a system, a method, a formula, a way of doing life or doing business, doing something that other people out there want to know. They're out there beating their head against the wall trying to figure it out. You've already figured it out. So you're going to make an offer for them to come work with you and learn from you so they don't have to reinvent the wheel. It's yeah. essentially cutting a check for speed. Sure, I love that. And you've helped me a ton in my events. Uh, we met in like 2019 when I was taking over my real estate investment education ed education company for my mentor, and we did an event and did better than I. I mean, you 2019. Could, I thought it was before that. It was uh, no, it was 2019. It was I bought the company in July 2019, and we met three or four months before that. So I, wow. But I mean, when you look back, it's almost five years now. Which well, I feel like I've known you for the longest time. Wow. Well, uh, you've helped me a ton. We've spent quite a bit of time together setting up all these events and things <laughs> and then being in groups together the past few years. But uh, can you name some of the other uh, like clients and people that you've worked with in the past and work with now? Yeah. Let's see. Who would people know? Like maybe a Tony Robbins or... I think this people is would know that guy. Maybe, maybe. And, you know, I think a crazy one, the one that even surprised me was Matthew McConaughey. Like that... that oh, tell me about that. That I didn't expect. Uh, well, I have a client, Dean Graziosi, good friend and client. He's a partner of Tony Robbins. We do a lot of events together. And he decided to launch a product with Matthew. And so he called me up and said, hey, would you be willing to do that? And I'm like, I'd not only be willing, I'd be honored. I would love to do that. I'm a big fan of Matthew McConaughey and Green Lights, um, which is his book. And so we put together a live event for him and his first ever course based on the book. And again, like kind of going back to, this was actually a low ticket offer, not a high ticket offer. It was fairly inexpensive. But the key was he wrote this book, Green Lights, and then people started just flooding him with questions. Like it was his story about how he made decisions in his life and got to where he is. People started flooding him with like, how do you make the decisions? Like we get what you did, but how do we take it and do it for ourselves? How do we decide the difference between a red light, a yellow light, and a green light? So he created a playbook for that. and We helped him design it. It was really amazing, actually. It's a great product. And I think it's the coolest thing, like what we get to do with you, Tony, Matthew, or names that you've never even heard of, is kind of helping you conceptualize how do you take the stuff you know and turn it into a consumable product so that other people can use it. Canfield's a client of ours, good friend of ours, Amy Porterfield, Mary Morrissey, Gabby Bernstein. We get to work with some awesome people, Jeff Walker. We're pretty lucky. I mean, we work with some amazing people in our space, like you, when we helped you create your program. I yep. working with you. And that was a total redesign. Uh, you helped me with the naming. You helped me with the, the idea, the strategy, the vision, the path, all that stuff. It wasn't just the event. It was so many more things that just having a sounding board and somebody who can uh, bounce ideas off of and, and keep, keep me straight, actually, a lot of times. Uh, most of the time, as entrepreneurs, we want to do all these big things and we have these crazy ideas and we want to change things at the last minute. I'd say the thing that every time I talk to you, what I get, and you're probably noticing this watching this video right now, is a calming tone and somebody who says, I'm not sure if that's such a good idea. It doesn't say don't do that, but says here's why I might think about not doing that. The only time I'm not calm is when I have to fly the plane. As long as <laughs> the tone totally shifts the minute you want me to take the wheel. But beside that, yeah, listen, I think it's important to be grounded in this industry and calm. But I think the thing, you didn't ask me this question, but I think it's an important um, the question you don't ask that you need to know, is people try to put way too much stuff into their high ticket offers and into their live events. Like generally what I find is people think they don't have enough stuff then they overcompensate by putting in way too much stuff. And really what people are paying you for in a high ticket offer, and even in a live event, is not to tell them everything you know, to tell them what they need to know. 
that distinguish, like they're paying you for your lens. I think it's the thing that a lot of people miss. And it kind of ties into these days, so everything's free on the internet. And so I hear people say, like, are people still going to buy coaching or products or programs or go to live events? Because honestly, these days, everything's free. And I think that's why they're paying you is because everything's free. There's so much out there. It's so overwhelming. So if they can pay you for your lens and say, hey, Bill, when it comes to real estate, there's so much stuff. I've been on the internet for hours. And I just, the more I study, the more lost I feel because there's competing examples and contradictory opinions. What should I do? And you're like, well, let me show you. Like, I've figured it out. I've got a formula, a framework. I'm not going to tell you everything I know. I know a lot. I've been doing this for a long time. I'm really, really good at it. I'm going to put it through my lens and only tell you what you need to know. It's worth paying for because it saves you time and energy and gives you calm and confidence and better results. Yeah, for sure. You, I think people right now, we're drowning in information. Especially if you're watching this YouTube video, there's hundreds of other, thousands and millions and millions of other channels. Dinner, how many podcasts are there? Someone was just talking to me about this. It's like a staggering number. Of Most podcasts. people are listening to eight to ten different ones, probably. And they're listening to lots of different people. So they're just really just like kind of starving for wisdom and drowning in information. Sure. And sometimes just a little entertainment, a little fun, like today. And I love what you said. It's like, you're not giving them everything that you know. And so this like kitchen sink offer, like throw it in, throw it in, throw it in. It sounds like that is probably not the play these days. It's interesting. I've been doing this 20 years and I remember in the early days, like back, you know, 2004 to 2008, offers really were everything but the kitchen sink offers. Kind of like, but wait, there's more. We throw in another bonus. We'll throw in this. We got that. You'll get the whole library. You'll get lifetime access. You'll get, and I think literally today, if you do that to people, they just walk the other way. Like, Time overwhelmed since COVID is really a thing. People feel so overwhelmed with the amount of information. Add AI to that, it's even more confusing because that feels scary also for a lot of people. And just all this stuff out there. And they're trying to deal with taking in more information than they've ever had to take in since we've had humans on the planet. There's never been this much information coming at you that you have to sort through, filter through, and think through. And we're being asked to do more in less time than we've ever done before. So technology has helped and hurt. So, yeah, I think what they're really looking for is what's the least amount of stuff you can give me to give me the biggest outcome? Meaning, it's not, you have to really be clear on that part too, right? They're, I actually heard a good friend of ours say this. Um, they're not buying trainings. They're not buying deliverables. They're buying outcomes and results. So the question to be asking yourself is like, what's the fastest path to the outcome with the least amount of stuff, not the most amount of stuff? Yeah, I love that. What, what would you say to someone who's watching this and it's like, actually, I, there's something that I do that I could teach and sell. Like, how would this, somebody like that get started? What would be your first step of, of trying to figure out how to do something like this? Uh, that's a really good question. I mean, I'd start with writing down my journey. Like, where did I start? What, what the, the future casting of, like, where I am now and where I started and what was the path to get me from point A to point B and then whittling that down into a short set of action steps, like no more than 12 action steps that would get you there. And then breaking down each of those steps into the sub steps that, again, not everything you had to do, only, not everything you did, only recommend the things that you think they need to do. For example, you'd map out the path that you took, and then you'd map out the little micro steps that got you there. And then you'd whittle out, you'd take out anything that you're like, you know, I did do that, but looking back on it, I wouldn't do it again, or you don't need to do that. You only need to do this. Like you're mapping out the fastest path start with your own path, then whittle it down to the thing you'd actually recommend. If you had it to do all over again, what would you do? And, and who would you who would you recommend that if they're going to create something to help somebody else? Like, who is the person that they would they turn around and look for to sell something like that to? Yeah, so I think, I actually teach this exercise. I call it the big why. And it's literally an X and Y axis. And the heart of it is, what's your big why? Like, what's motivating you personally, professionally, financially? like spiritually to do this offer, then who is it for? Who's your right fit client? What's their big why? So they're like counterbalances. What's your big why? What's their big why? And they're usually related. They may even be the same. Your right fit client's big why might be your big why. But those counterbalances are important to kind of think about what's motivating you and what's motivating them. Because at the end of the day, motivation is what drives us. And then I map out what would make that right fit client, the person that you know you're meant to work with, rave, renew, and recruit. Like, rave about you, renew in your program year after year, and recruit other people. Like, go out and literally say, you've got 
to do this. This is incredible. I got the most amazing results. Those are those deliverables. That's that path that we talked about. And then counterbalancing that are your non-negotiables. What is that? This is actually more important than anything. It's the things you wouldn't do no matter how much money they pay you. So right now for you, what's something you know your clients would love for you to do, but no matter what, doesn't matter how much they pay you, it's not worth your time. Like one-on-one one on one access, <laughs> uh, like call me anytime, text me anytime, get on the calendar. Like w w I'm back to that one-on-one -on -one coaching again that I was in 2019, if you remember. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's a common answer, by the way. The bigger the influencer, the more likely they're going to say, especially over time, I, I love my right fit client. I really want them to get results. I can't do it one-on-one because -on -one, we're trading hours for dollars on one-to-one. -one. Yeah, I'm open to doing one-to-one -one on a short consulting period now, but not for a long-term one year or two like years. Like what would it cost like to do that? Uh, it, there's not a price. Like right? literally exactly. uh, a couple hundred thousand dollars. Right. right. Uh, maybe, maybe a million bucks, but honestly, I probably wouldn't take it because... I don't know that I could produce those kind of results for that person that I, I would feel good about accepting that level of payment. And that's the problem that I have is, is if, I, if you're going to pay me that, I need to be able to produce a 10x return or more for you. And so that's where I would struggle, and that's where I have struggled with one-on-one -on -one in the past. And now you're getting into the pricing piece, which I think is interesting. Like once you know what your right fit client would love, what would make them rave, renew, and recruit, you can think about, okay, what's that worth to them? Like what is that outcome worth? and start to price it and balance it against your own time and your own non-negotiables. I have a client whose non-negotiables were, I love skiing in the winter. I have ski Fridays, so nothing that compromises ski Fridays. And then I take a rafting trip every August, and so nothing that compromises rafting in August. Then nothing lights me up more than spending time with my wife and my kids, so nothing on the weekends and nothing. And anything that we came up with that would make his clients his right fit clients, and right fit is like the people that are most right fit for you, um, anything that would make them rave, renew, and recruit that compromised those non-negotiables was a no. And I think when, when people are just getting started, they're like, I'll do anything. Listen, if they're willing to pay me, I'll do anything. It might be true at the beginning, but shortly once you start making money, and you will with your high ticket offer, once you start making money, then you're the non-negotiables really come into play. It becomes that, you know that Star Wars, I think it's Han Solo, who's like, no reward is worth this. Like, yeah, I think that's what it gets to. No reward is worth this, doesn't matter how much you're paying me. So why not design it from the beginning the way you want it to be versus having to whittle services out later once you start making money. Uh, Just design it that way from the beginning. I love that. All of these things, the steps you kind of took me through in 2019 in a 15-minute uh, conversation now. You mentioned the, the, the person who's creating this offer to go back in their past and look at the steps that they took. Can we go back in your past and me just being at your house in, in Charleston, which is a beautiful house and the life that you have right now, um, maybe you can go back to your, kind of your journey and tell us about that. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, I never guessed I would end up where I am now. I started my business back in 2004 as a just until business, meaning at the time I was married, my husband's family business and when it imploded, he imploded. And I didn't think we were going to be able to pay our bills. And I'm like, you know what? Until he, just until he gets on his feet again, I'm going to, I'm going to do this event planning thing. I'm pretty good at running events. I'm going, to, I'm going to run events just until. And then the event business really took off. Like I think in the first year, I got introduced to Bo Glazer and Dan Kennedy, who were pioneers in our industry, kind of godfathers of our industry. We were planning events for them. They all had high ticket offers. So I started to learn the high ticket offer model. And if I go back and look at what really made my business scale quickly, because within a couple of years I had one employee, and then two years later I had five employees. Um, I was hoping to make 100000 before I knew it. I was making a million. Now we're an eight-figure business. That's happened over the course of 20 years. Like, if I were to go back and be like, what really made that happen? I think it actually lines up with what a high-ticket offer does. Is I had accountability, which I think is accountability. I had a really amazing community, unique community. You can't do this in a silo. You can't do it alone. You can't grow something alone. I really think it's hard to do. You look at the best people in the world, like the best celebrities, politicians, sports, any industry where people are at the top of their game, guaranteed they have people around them who are really amazing, who are keeping them accountable, and are providing a community of like-mindedness, like-minded approach, and then enhanced opportunity. I invested early on in getting coaches and mentors so I didn't have to figure it out myself. What does that mean, enhanced opportunity? It's like when I think of enhanced opportunity, I think be to have make more. Like
they can be. Be more clear, be more confident, be more courageous, do, do more in less time, have, like, have more work-life balance, for example. Like, what's the have for your right fit client? And then make, I mean, we generally think make more, like make more money. But if you're in the personal development space, like a lot of my clients are, it might be make more love, make more light, make more health. It doesn't have to be make more wealth. It's the concept of more, making more. So enhanced opportunity. So you've got, think of it as an acronym, ACE, A-C-E, accountability, community, enhanced opportunity to be, do, have, and make more in less time. So I invested in all of those things, which really allowed me to scale quickly. And then there was the second half of the equation. And Tony Robbins calls this, this is the definition of mastery. I think he's really right. The minute I heard it, I'm like, yep, that's it. Repetition, immersion, and modeling proven practices. You can think of that acronym as REM. It's like repeat it till you're good at it, be immersed in it every day, and model proven practices. Like don't, don't reinvent the wheel. Find someone who's already done it, figured it out, and follow the steps that they did so that you don't have to do it. Did all of those things. And that repetition, I think, Bill, this is crazy, but before COVID hit, I think that we were doing like 42 to 50 events a year. So if you think of the number of weeks in a year, so my husband and I were on the road almost, I don't know. I mean, I think we were at home for like holidays and a couple weeks in the summer. We were on the road every other week. So and, that, and a lot of times at different events. Sometimes dividing and conquering, which is my least favorite. So we like doing events together. But yeah, pre-COVID, it was like almost every week we were traveling. That's repetition and immersion. And then we can increasingly like model proven practices, some of which we were creating, some of which we're adopting along the way. Doesn't mean you have to like do whatever you're doing every single week in an exhaustive way. But I think in the early stages, like when I look at how I got to where I am, I mean, probably true for you too. Like, weren't you just relentless about it? Like I was just obsessed. I was obsessive about, I love what I do. I'm passion and purpose are a big piece of this too. Like I'll just throw that in there. Be really passionate have a lot of purpose. I mean, if you love what you do, it never feels like work. I don't think I minded working 24-7 because I loved it. There's this area that, like, I look at that hedgehog concept that Jim Collins talks about in his book, Good to Great. He says, well, what's your best in the world, what you're uniquely suited to do, and then what has an opportunity to drive some revenue? And it, most businesses, you look at all those three. So now, er, that's the lens I put everything through. Like, I would do it for free. I just love doing it. I kick the sheets off the bed and do it for free. Um, I'm really, really good at it, and it's in my area of brilliance. And then it has an opportunity to make me money. It's not just going to, you know, break even or lose money, but there's a big opportunity there. And, and so if it has all three of those, then I'm interested. But I get hit with a lot of opportunities all the time. And if they don't pass that test, I'm not, I, I don't say yes anymore. I think that gets into non-negotiables. Yeah, it's interesting. One of the things I learned along the way, it was probably 10 years into my business before I really got this, is opportunity cost, meaning what you say no to might be more important than what you say yes to. Yes. Um, in the beginning, though, I think you say yes to everything, <laughs> yeah. you know, just to get good at I it. I did, And yeah. then you start to filter out what doesn't work, and you start to put it through the lens of those non-negotiables. It also teaches you things. You know, you get some training. I didn't like this. I like this. But you, you don't know in the beginning, usually. Uh, like, I started flipping houses. I thought that was great. I had a lot of fun. But then I just got frustrated with all the inspectors, the realtors, the, the person who's complaining about the little things that we're doing in the house. Like, it's not a new house. This is a 30-year-old house that we're fixing up. It's way nicer. Instead of nitpicking, I just got tired of all the retail stuff and make, making people happy because there's a dream house. And then I went to the investment side of being more of a wholesaler and, and doing volume. So I think it's important to try those things out and know that whatever step you're taking right now is not your ultimate step down the road. Because I'm sure just when you got started, started then was, yeah, just go. Yeah. Uh, it's funny. that I was thinking when you were talking, the first thing, I thought I was going to be a wedding planner. Like, if I'm being really honest, like the first three months of my fledgling business where I think I could be a wedding planner because I love events and I love weddings, so this will be awesome. And then I planned three weddings for free just to kind of get like get it figured out, see if it was right, just for friends. Like, yeah, I'll, I'll be your wedding planner for free. I'll do it. And I quickly realized I was not a wedding planner. I realized, like, I want to plan my dream wedding, not your dream wedding. Like, if they if they didn't do, if they wanted to do something I didn't like, I'm like, oh, no, I don't want to do it. It's a lot of drama. But it allowed me to say, oh, you know what I really am good at? corporate events, which led to information marketing events. And, you know, if you hadn't stumbled through the first door, you wouldn't make it to the next door. So you just have to get started. Like, get started somewhere. Like, dreaming is the opposite of doing. You start with the dream, but then you have to get into the do. Yep. All right. Let's, um, we're, at, we're getting close to Merle's Inlet right now. Are. This is Myrtle Beach right up here. You can probably see. 
Uh, Merle's Inlet is down there. We're kind of on top of it. So I need to get, uh, I need to stay outside of this Class Charlie airspace. Okay. And we'll descend, and then we'll kind of pop in, try to see your house. And then what we'll do is we'll kind of climb up on our way back, and we'll finish the interview. Sound good? Okay, that sounds great. Okay, so I'm just going to uh, kind of maneuver us down a bit. All right, so coming left. Start working my altitude here. So as long as I don't get within five, 1,200 feet, I got. All right, here we go. I gotta stay outside five miles at this altitude without talking to anybody. So, so what's our altitude right now? Uh, a thousand feet. Got it. Oh my gosh, that's crazy. It's like we're like hovering right above the water. It's amazing. Oh yeah, helicopter's way better. We could be down at like a hundred feet, fifty feet. That's real flying. It's a lot of fun. Blue, oh this is a great view of those new houses on the point. Yeah, you can also see the dredging, dredging. operation. You guys yeah. uh, feel free to take pictures or whatever you want to do too. Right? We'll get something, I think. Uh, so interesting. It's a little bit more precision flying because I don't want to bust the airspace. Even in the turn, you got to maintain altitude pretty well. And we're like plus or minus. We're like just like 200 feet under the shelf. Yeah, it is just incredible. Like to see these waterways we always go through from this angle is so awesome. Wow. That's cool. That is awesome. All right. Got Thank you for doing that. Yeah, absolutely. It's incredible. Let's come down. I'll take it down this side on the beach side. I really didn't realize how un, um, uninhabited so much of this was right behind us. Like, it's really interesting. Oh, I'll tell you what. When you fly over the United States, I realize you realize stuff. how much land we have. There's, I'm happy to hear that. There is land everywhere. The fact that people are complaining about we're not making any land. and no, You just all live by the coast. Everybody lives by the water, which makes sense. We need water to survive. Yep. But not, when, that, not that water. When, no, <laughs> when you fly around, it, it's shocking about how much open space there is, nobody living there. And it's not just marshland like this. It's, it's all of Texas. It's all of New Mexico. It's the whole Midwest. It's everywhere. Like, we just are all smashed into these big cities. So I always find that fascinating when I'm flying around the country and I look down and it's like, you know, millions and millions of acres of open land with no housing. Okay, so it sounds like like right now in your business, you mentioned you've been in business for 20 years and you're doing really well. Um, I, you know, I was at your house, spent time there. Um, was it always that way? Like, did you grow up with uh, money? Like, uh, were you always an entrepreneur and made a bunch of money even from the start? Like, what was it like just maybe your early life? Because I think it's, like, most people will watch this and say, oh, yeah, she can do it, but I can't do it. Like, what was that like? Uh, I think like so many people in our industry, I started with nothing. I think the best thing about the information marketing business or industry is that anybody with a big idea can create a really big business and change their life with money freedom. Like I started in this little tiny neighborhood called Pocahontas Village in Virginia Beach, was on the outskirts of my school district. And not only was it on the outskirts, it was on the wrong side of the railroad tracks. You know that saying like wrong side of the railroad tracks? There were literally railroad tracks and there was our neighborhood. It was literally on the wrong side. Tiny little house, like three little three bedroom, one bathroom, ranch house, Pocahontas Village. I Googled it recently and like the only picture I could find was like there was a cracked sidewalk and a crushed Budweiser. <laughs> but you know, I mean to be fair, my dad worked really hard. I mean, my dad was fixed copiers for a living, worked nine to five. I remember he had to wear a clip tie so that if it got caught in the copier, it wouldn't strangle him and like steel toed shoes. And I think now like I probably make more, I'll see it, this is crazy, I haven't thought of it this way. I make more on a four hour strategy day for my clients than my dad made all year. And he still managed to, you know, pay all of our bills and pay for our house. And my grandparents started a college fund for me so I could go to college. If it had been for that, I probably wouldn't have been able to go to college. Like. When I look back to those days, I remember my mom used to, like, make things and sell them to local stores to help pay for her clothes. She used to make her clothes on the sewing machine. I remember I hated that. I did not want to wear clothes that my mom made on a sewing machine. So when I think about that and then think about where I am now, it's honestly hard to fathom. I always knew, though, like, did you know this when you were growing up that you were meant for more? Uh, I don't, I don't know. Um. Like early on, I thought that. I thought, I, like, there's got to be more than this. We had the benefit of a family. There's my parents' best friends. They'd gone to high school together, these couples. 
I decided to go all in on himself and he borrowed some money and started a used car dealership that turned into a car dealership that turned into a bunch of car dealerships. And in the summer, we would spend time with them. Frank and Phyllis Bernard, God love them. I mean, it literally changed my whole perspective on what was possible watching them accelerate their wealth and create time and money freedom and an incredible lifestyle. And if I honestly, if I hadn't seen that, I might not have known what was possible. That probably got me started thinking there is more and I'm meant for more. Maybe I could create that. And at the time, I just thought the only way to do it is study hard, like study hard, make good grades. Then you'll go to college, then you'll study hard, make good grades, and then you'll get a good job and then you'll be able to make more. But I think the thing that's incredible about our industry is that you can take what you know and sell it, not trade hours for dollars, and make more in an hour than you could make in a year if you just have the courage and the confidence to do it. You know, you asked me that question, and as you were talking, I was thinking, for me, I never knew anyone who made more than like a hundred to one hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. So my whole upbringing was, like you said, go to college, get a good job, become an engineer, work in an office, and make one hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. And, and that, and I mapped everything out for save this much, invest this, and you'll be a millionaire by the time you're sixty-five, and you'll use that for retirement and pull on, an, on a six percent per year rate that you pull out. And that was it. I, I nobody in my family. I never knew anybody. They that made more than one hundred fifty thousand dollars a year until my dad started his own engineering business in our basement. But I watched him slave over that for years and years and years. And ten years in, it became successful. But I was in college, and and he missed a lot of my life. Because you know, of that. for me, my father passed away of a massive heart attack at the breakfast table at forty eight. Just graduated from college, and I think that really changed me. He'd spent his life working toward a retirement he never got to yeah. and it did make me a little more fearless I think and just thinking you don't know how much time you have I really felt like I had an expiration date of 48 I've now passed that I remember when I passed that thinking you know I've, I've achieved something because I made it past 48 but I think it made me just realize like you have to go for it now because you don't know how much time you have it's a good way to live your life just thinking about you we always kind of live like we have endless time but if you knew you didn't have endless time, what would you do differently? What risk might you take? What courage might you gain? What would you do differently? What are you tolerating now that you shouldn't, that you don't want to? What's the dream life you really want to have? And what's the fastest path to get there? And either find the person to help you do it or become the person <laughs> that yep. helps you do it or both, right? Yeah. And when you say, did I know I was meant for more? Like, I feel like I knew that I was going to do something, and but I just... It was never like more, it was just the same. Like I was like, I'll, I, I'll, I'll match that because I never had an example. Like I, I didn't watch a video like this. Yeah. There wasn't never a had, video like this. Yeah. <laughs> there I mean, was, it didn't exist when we were growing up. Yeah. We didn't have this. It, but I, you know, I never was around somebody who was like making a million dollars in a year. Like there were people that I knew that had become millionaires by saving and investing and working, but that wasn't an example that I had at all. So. Um, and, but, you know, uh, and to some people that are watching this, they might be like, I'd love to make 100000 or $150,000 a year. Like, they don't even have that example. But when you watch something like this or you get exposed to something like this, you realize that you, maybe you are meant for more. But I, never, I don't think I ever had that as an example. I remember when we bought the house, we just flew over. And uh, my husband, Blue, and I bought that house together. And I really felt like we have achieved something. It reminded me of that house Phyllis and Frank had when I was growing up. And I remember thinking, like, what do you have to do to live in a house like that? And it's, here's a really funny story. So we now have a house in Charleston, too. So we have the, the beach house. We have a house, what we call the city house in Charleston. And um, when I was 21, I went on a trip to Charleston for work. And I stayed over an extra day because I love history. I wanted to see the city. And I asked the hotel concierge, what's, what's something fun to do if you have a day in the city? And he's like, we're in luck. There's a home and garden tour. Charlestonians open their houses up. And you can go tour them. I'm like, oh, that sounds amazing. I remember I paid like $35. There was like seven houses on this tour. And local Charlestonians had opened up their mansions. And you could go in and see the history of the house. And fast forward, like literally, gosh, that's scary, 40 years. Um, fast forward 40 years to today. The house we bought in Charleston, we moved in. And the Charleston Home and Garden Society came to us and said, would you be willing to have your house on the Home and Garden Tour? I remember when I was walking through at 21 thinking, what do you to live in, who lives in a house like this? And what do you have to do to live in a house like this? And to fast forward and think, well, 
People like me live in a house like this, and I know exactly what you have to do. That's to incredible. To bet on yourself. <laughs> you know, work hard, believe strong, but just get out of your own way and do it. Yeah, it's an incredible story. What about somebody, like, what would you say to somebody who is, like, feeling stuck right now or is living that life that you were living before to to make a change? Like, they don't have the example around them. They don't have those kind of things. Like, what can they, what can they do? Like, what should, what should they do? Uh, treat your current job as a bank loan, not a destiny. Like, immediately say, I don't love what I'm doing, but I'm willing to do it because it's going to pay for the dream I'm trying to fund. And then immediately dedicate yourself to getting started, just getting out there. What's the thing you're good at? Just get started there. And then finding someone to help you. you can, if you have to start online, start online. There's low ticket offers, high ticket offers out there to help you. But honestly, finding that accountability, community, and enhanced opportunity that we talked about earlier, repeating it, being immersed in it, and modeling proven practices so you're not reinventing the wheel can literally collapse decades into days. But like you could spend 10 years doing it or one year doing it. You want to spend one year doing it. You want to collapse 10 years into one. You want to get there as fast as you can. And if you're thinking, I'm sort of clear on what I want to do, good enough. Like that's good enough. What did you think you wanted to do when you got started? I know for me, it was like the just until business that okay. turned into a real business that then turned into more than a real business. But what was your original dream for you? Uh, well, so I thought that I was going to fly for the Navy forever, retire, and then on the side, I started side hustling, flipping houses. And so I made $43,000. It was half of my salary for the year. After that, all I wanted to do was prove that I could do it again. I did a, it took me a year to do another one, and I made $45,000. And then I said, okay, there's something here. And then I saw somebody that was doing 100 houses a year. And I said, okay, I wonder if I could do 12. It, could they help me and teach me how to do 12? And that's when I took a leap and jumped, and I bought a high-ticket program when I'd bought nothing before ever. I bought a $25,000 program from the guy who was flipping 100 houses a year. And it, frankly, it was all because of my dad. I mean, my dad said, uh, he, he challenged me, I, and I was looking at it like a liability. I said, that's an Acura. Like, that's a car. $25,000 a car. A car. And keep in mind, Absolutely. I never went to an event. I never bought a book. I was the cheapest person on the planet, pretty much. I was, I was just saving and dumping all, as much money as I could into the stock market at the time. And, and my, I called my dad, and he said, well, it sounds like they're a consultant. He said, how much did you make on your last house? I said, 45000 He goes, do you think that these guys could help you do one more of those? And I said, well, I should think so. They're doing 100 and if they can't help me do one more, it's not worth it. And he's like, all right, well, is it worth paying $25,000 to make $45,000? And he said, it sounds like you don't believe in yourself, son. Because if you believe that these guys can help you, it sounds like you don't believe in yourself. And that hit me hard. And oh. it's like, when you say that to me, type A, military guy, go-getter, like, so those were fighting words. And I said, all right, I'm all in. And what I did was I paid all the money, and I went all in. And when they told me to jump, I said, how high? And, you did. and I just did everything that I was told. I, fu I didn't listen to anyone else. I think the problem is a lot of people are trying to listen to four or five coaches. I, I totally agree I listened to one, Pick and one. I did everything, and I did 67 houses that year in eight months instead of the 12 that I was trying to do. You just said a bunch of really important things. Like you think about the ROI. Do I think I'll make this investment back first and foremost, if not double it or triple it or whatever, and then choose the unconventional path, do what they say to do, don't question it, don't mess with the formula, just show up and do it and pick one thing and be obsessive about it. You can always coach with somebody else next. You don't coach with five people at the same time, especially, I mean, maybe once you get, I mean, more established, but not when you're getting started. You start I still don't that. even think that's true. Yeah. Like, it, it, if there's something that I need to learn, I'm going to go that's learn it from the person, thing. and I'm going to fix that problem before I go try to fix three or four at the same time. Maybe think of something else that's interesting, and, you know, a lot of us go to a parent or a spouse or a trusted friend, a sister, or best friend, whatever, college buddy, and say, what do you think I should do? And you're asking the person who's least qualified to help you make a decision. Like, they're, you're going to be an entrepreneur, they're not an entrepreneur. You're going to be in real estate, they're not in real estate. And you're like, what do you think I should do? Because they're the person you know to ask. And your dad, you're lucky, gave you really great advice. But a lot of times, our people closest to us will try and keep us safe. Like, their best interest is to keep you safe. And they'll tell you just to take the conventional path. Stay in the job. Do the thing. Like, remember how it didn't work out for Uncle Joe? People like us don't make money like that. Like, they can only make it from their unique perspective. And I learned this from Trent Shelton. He's like, everybody has their own prescription. Like, that prescription for your eyes, you have a prescription for your vision. Not just your eye vision, but your, your life vision. 
and you can't trust that to anybody else. You've got to listen to your own vision. Make your reason not to your reason too. Like you've got to literally take the thing. You don't have time to do it. That's why you have to do it. You don't have money to do it. That's why you have to do it. Unfortunately, at that time, board, that's why you need coaching. Fortunately, at that time, my dad had built his business up. It became very valuable, and he was at a place where he had worked with consultants before. And so he compared it to a consultant that would come into his business that they would pay 50k for and would show them $200,000 in savings or a quarter million dollars in savings to see a ROI on it. And he was also was one of my best you know, guides and mentors throughout the way. But you're exactly right. If my dad was still working a W-2 job for somebody else and I went to him and said, hey, dad, I want to do this, he probably would say, oh, that's a, that's a waste of money. Don't do that. Like, you can't do that. because it's like a cult. He doesn't have the life. He doesn't have, uh, he's never done it before, those kind of things. But he had invested in himself, in his business, in his education. But he didn't, like, I didn't grow up with him watching Tony Robbins and doing all that stuff. Like, I, I asked him if he, he didn't even know who Tony, he's like, I think I know who Tony Robbins is, but, you know, he wasn't the personal development guy, but he read books, uh, encyclopedias, studied. I'll say, I think the thing that I have that a lot of people don't have that I think if you're watching this, you can really learn from, is when you do buy something like this, the key is you have to be a good student. You have to, you have to be a good student, you ha and you have to, you know, participate. Willing to apply. It's not a magic yeah. wand. you got to actually get out there and do the thing. Yep. And don't get stuck in the learning loop. And it's easy to say, easier said than done, but that learning loop will keep you stuck. Keep watching videos, keep watching podcasts, keep, you know, reading books, those kind of things and never actually going out to do. So I would I would learn and do and, and basically test. I, I, I have this, like, this loop that I go through of decision making, which the military really helped me with, is you have to go out there and test. I mean, every it's a hypothesized test pivot. Your hypothesis is just an educated guess of what you think is going to happen. It, it's not guaranteed. If I have a 55 or 60% chance of succeeding, I'm going to take the risk. As long as the benefit outweighs the cost of the risk. And just like this, we're flying an airplane. I had to decide, do I want to go down to 1,000 feet inside that area? I, I was not looking outside. They were looking outside at their houses. I was looking inside at our instruments to make sure I didn't bust airspace. I, I didn't go too far. We didn't get too low. It wasn't unsafe. Where towers are around. And I was doing that, and we were not doing an interview while they were looking outside. And I decided that the benefit for Barry and Blue and everybody on board to see their house and everything is worth the the cost that I would I would have to put a little bit more attention on altitude and things like that. So it's constantly happening inside of our head, risk reward benefit, cost, all of those analysis that are happening. And that's the practice, I think, that happens in the military that could be passed on to somebody that's that's not in the military. So, yeah, Thank you for your service, by the way. Oh, absolutely. It was, my, it was my honor, and they paid me kind of, They paid me okay for it. But I got to go to some really cool places and I do some like cool stuff. People in the military learn so much about strategy and about how to think. You know, it's really, there's so many successful people that come out of the military because you learn strategic thinking. It's true, but I think the interesting thing is we don't understand what, what happened to us. We got brainwashed in a good way most of the time, but we don't understand what we're doing. And so what I've been, I've been studying this a lot, not just you know military, but firefighters, police officers, uh, nurses, doctors, lawyers, people that have to go through like rigorous high-risk training because the decisions that we're making, they're, they're, we're not making them. We're not not making them out of fear. It's out of a perceived risk, I feel like. I think fear is equivalent to risk. So, I mean, we could talk about this for another few hours. Putting head away risk, that was probably one of the most important things you could do in life. It's totally. all risk reward. Totally. And so we have so this thing called operational risk management. There's a couple principles to it. One is we only make risk when benefits outweigh the cost. So we really need to analyze that. And the faster we can get to analyzing it, the easier we, quicker we make decisions that are good decisions. And then the second one that I really love is we only make risk decisions at the appropriate level. So it means, like, you know, my employees and staff have to know what kind of decisions they can make and when they need to come to me. And unless we can really start training to that and talking to that, um, a lot of times what happens is, you know, you think that your employees are coming to you all the time with decisions that they should make on their own. Well, it's your fault as a leader because you haven't actually shown them what decisions they can make and which ones you need to make. And so... Uh, Doing that in the military was really important. We have rules of engagement. We have areas that we know that we can make decisions, when we have to bring it up to our leadership team. And so we're implementing that in our business now a lot inside my company. So that, And right now, we're in a war time where we didn't make as much money last year as we have in the past. So those decisions are now starting to move back up to higher levels. So the decisions that my team could make before, they feel like I'm taking it from them. But in fact, I'm a wartime CEO right now, not a peacetime CEO. So when that happens, the rules of engagement change. And that also has to be communicated by team. That's interesting, wartime, peacetime CEO. Totally, because right now, my team and my staff is like, why are you getting in my Cheerios? 
<laughs> well, we lost money last year. And so that decision that used to, you, I used to be fine with you making, I'm sorry, I have to make it right now, only because I answer to the shareholders, I answer to the profitability, I answer to the bottom line, and, and you I work th here. I think to give them environmental context, like we're in wartime, things look different than when we're in peacetime. I sure. love that. I'm going to use that, by the way. Yeah, you got it. I mean, we make decisions through the three R's. It's like risk, reward, regret. Like how big is the risk? How big is the reward? And what would the potential regret be if we didn't do it? So, like, this game of, like, we play the what-if game, what's the worst that could happen if we did this? And then does that outweigh the regret we'd have if we don't do it and stay where we are? And it's never led me wrong. Like, you know, I think so often we're afraid of a failure, but some of my best learnings have come from failure. So this oh. idea that we just want to get it perfect, we never want to get it wrong, we always want it to be right, will keep you stuck and broke forever. Totally. If you look back to everything that's been good in your life, it's been on the backside of something that's really bad, Please. really hard. Always. Uh, okay, let's just do a quick fire round. So, all right, what's the most amount of money that you've ever made in a day? It's, it's crazy for me to say out loud for myself, but $1.5 million for myself. Like, Blue and I did that running our own event with our own high-ticket offer. And then for a client, $25 million. $25 million in a day yeah. for a client at their event? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's a good day. Um, what's the biggest mistake that you've ever made in business? 100% trading hours for dollars and not hosting my own live event. Doing it for everybody else and not myself. The minute we did it for ourselves, everything changed. What's the hardest thing that you face working with your spouse? I'm listening. Spouse is on board, so I have to really think about this carefully. <laughs> Honestly, we are pretty simpatico at work. The biggest challenge I face with Blue is that if he works for 45 minutes, then he's got to have play for 45 minutes. And I could just sit and work and work and work and never play. But actually, I'd be better off if I did more play. What's the best thing about working with your spouse? Really smart. And he challenges me every day in the best of ways. And there's no way we'd be where we are if it wasn't for him. What's the best piece of advice you can give to somebody who's just getting started in a business today? Don't wait. Don't think about it. Don't wait weeks, months, years. Get started today. What's the biggest something, pick something you're really good at and get started today. What's the biggest piece of advice you can give to somebody who wants to start a business but maybe doesn't know where to start or, or what they do? Find, kind of what you did. Find somebody who's doing what you want and follow them. Model them. What's the worst decision that you ever made in business? The ones we make too slowly. The decisions that we make too slowly always turn out to be my worst decision ones I end up regretting. The ones I labor over are the ones I regret. So, something, make a decision, and move quick. Absolutely. Right or wrong, make a decision. 100%. Love it. And it's money. Love it. What's the best piece of advice you can give to somebody who's already running a business right now and wants to grow it? At a high ticket offer. Like, at, at the scale of coaching one to many. Whether it's a mastermind, a group coaching program. 100% changes the leverage you have, the authority, the visibility, the credibility, the positioning, what you can charge, the net profit you're going to make, the net on it's crazy. What if they already have a high ticket offer, what recommendation would you give to them? Um, either launch it or scale it through a virtual live event because again, the net on it is crazy. So the first 17 years of our business, we did about 700 million in revenue that we could track for our clients and in-person events, high ticket offers and in-person events. The last, like, not even four years, we've done over a billion. It's like a billion three. The B? With the B, um, through the power of a virtual live event to launch a high ticket offer. And here's what's crazy out of that 1.3 billion, most of it's net profit for our clients because the overhead is so much less. You don't have the hotel, you don't have all the, you know, liability, room contracts, food and beverage minimums, all that stuff. So, yeah, that's the key. What would you say to a person who's running a live event now that's hesitant to do a virtual event because they love the connection of the live event? Actually, I can have better connection in a virtual event. You can speak directly to people from around the globe just by spotlighting them and unmuting them. Run a mic to somebody in an in-person ballroom takes a good amount of time. It takes seconds in a virtual event. So whenever people think it's less immersive, I actually think it's immersive, more immersive. I recently spoke to about 10,000 people on an in-person stage, and I was like, literally thought it was the most um, challenging thing because with virtual events I'm used to seeing their chat you know exactly what they're thinking every single minute in person event you're just having to guess oh. actually more immersive more interactive if done the right way in the right way fair so you mentioned all the virtual events that you guys are doing and we use your platform Abio it's a, a software that we use to be able to host 
of live virtual events because, you know, on Zoom, we just don't get the same feel and like all the really cool stuff that you guys are doing with like emojis in the background and getting more than, you know, a couple hundred people on Zoom. Uh, maybe you can talk about that and how integral that's been in what you guys are able to perform on a virtual live event to have the results that you guys have. Yeah, see, you know, what's really interesting is when COVID hit in 2020, we were doing 45 to 50 in-person events a year, and then all of our business evaporated literally in a single week. Postpone, cancel, postpone, cancel. And Blue, my husband and I had to make a quick decision what we were going to do. We decided virtual events, but we needed a platform to make it all work because our events are all enrollment events with high ticket offers. And Zoom only got us part of the way there. So my husband, Blue, put together this incredible platform specific for virtual live events doing enrollment with high ticket offers called Avio. And it's kind of crazy. In that like three month window in March 2020, we launched our own live event, our own high ticket offer, um, a studio and a software platform. I don't think anybody would do any one of those things, uh, maybe one of those things in a year, but not all four. But the thing that has really changed the virtual event landscape, not just for our business, for our clients, is Avio because it gives everybody a single place to log in. They go to the same place every day. It's highly interactive. It's highly intuitive and easy to use. And here's the thing, I think at latest count, there's like 396 million people on Zoom at any given minute. So any age group knows how to use Zoom courtesy of COVID, but putting this wrapper on it that makes it easier to access to buy a high ticket offer and to interact with your attendees. There's nothing like it on the market. and I'm super proud of him and the eight full-time developers we have from all around the world that work on it every single day, making it better. I mean, it's just, it's incredible what it can do. Yeah, it's been really awesome for us. We even use it for like our like webinars and challenges and fulfillment events. events for our fulfillment events for our people and stuff. Because and now they're used to the dashboard and they, we can put a landing page where they're going to buy something there and let it pop up at different times. Like the functionality and and the actual return on investment for that thing is insane. So if anybody something crazy that it can do, we just launched. This is so interesting for virtual events. Is it can track how many people are on at any given moment in time? Really get a graph that shows you how many people were on at any given moment in time, and at the touch of a button, you can export it and see who was and wasn't on, so you can segment who you're talking to, which is not unlike what you do for in-person events. Exactly, and I know Blue and I have been talking about that a lot as we build more, like I love data, and, and the high ticket conversion industry, it's who saw the offer, who didn't see the offer, now you can actually segment the marketing that you're gonna do to somebody who didn't see, because you can't buy an offer they didn't see. They're on, and you think they were on, because what does every person do that runs a Zoom webinar? They pull the highest number of attendees they had and the unique number of people. They don't look at the chats. They don't do any of that stuff. So the next level stuff that Blue's providing for the platform, I'm really excited about as a data nerd. And then figuring out the next step is, okay, how do we use that as a business? Because that's a bunch of hidden money inside your event that right now you're not tapping into. Well, think about it, even for your fulfillment events, like you know, a retreat, your mastermind, your group coaching program, if you're using this dashboard for that, you also know when they're logging in, how long they're logging in, if they're staying with you, get messaging to them to keep them engaged in your program. Yep. So it's fun. I mean, it's like great on the front end and the back end because you're right, data is king. Yeah. What information are they eating up? What are they? Ba what's bouncing? What's the retention rate like? That that's the kind of content that you want to put out maybe to a webinar because those are your best buyers. Now, if you put that content out to everyone, then you could do a webinar right after the event because you know that's the really hot stuff. That's what a lot of the stuff we're doing in person, like you talked about. Um, all right, you ready to land the plane? Ready. Uh, how, if they want to check Abio out, how can they do that? Just obv.io. Okay. If you want to check out the platform Abio, we'll drop a link in the description so you can just click on the link. Awesome. <laughs> All right, uh, we are going to land this plane. You ready for that? Uh, you are going to land this plane. Okay, under is on, that's good. Let's see. All right, here we go. Let's get a little speed back. Southwest Traffic, TBM 975, Charlie Alpha, five miles to the south, out of 2,000 feet inbound for landing 35, full stop, Mount Pleasant. You got to get skiers up, flaps up, turn our separators off. We'll get some speed. Mount Pleasant traffic, TBM 975, Charlie Alpha. We're going to be a left overhead 35, 1500 feet uh, inbound for a full stop landing at Mount Pleasant. All right, here we go. So that's about all the torque I got. So in the military, we come over to the aircraft carrier like this. We'll line up next to, so like, if this is the ship, this gets us in and out really quick. So we'll hit the numbers right here 1500 feet, usually about like 250. And then we'll power back right here. So here we go, right overhead, power's coming to idle. Landing gear. 
Yeah. Landing normal. gear. And I pull a little bit of G's here. Landing gear. Just a little bit. Landing gear. And I'll, they're below Landing 200. Gear. Separators coming Landing off. gear. Mount Pleasant traffic. Keep me up. Landing gear. Right Landing gear. Full stop. Mount Pleasant. Landing gear. Landing I know, gear. I know, I know. Chill out. Landing gear. Landing right, gear. Blowing 78 gears coming down. Flex. Landing gear. Landing gear. They're coming to take off. Landing gear. Landing Trimming. gear. The gear is coming down. Landing lady. gear. Landing so gear. That's the only downside of this plane. She's, she's yelling two at me. Five, it's kind of nice to have the reminder, just in case she's Yeah, for it. sure. All right, so we're now we're in the downwind. Inertial separator's on. Gear's down. Flaps are takeoff. So I'm trimming now. So that just like gets us set up for an easy approach like that fast. Ah. Mount Pleasant traffic, QBM 975, Charlie Alpha, turn right base 35, full stop, Mount Pleasant. All right, so now what we want to do is we want to set up where we're on a straightaway, like right there where the tree cutout is. So I'm kind of like descending and decelerating a little bit into a right turn now. So now I'm picking a place like down here. Right. So I'm going to pick like that green building, green roof building there to kind of hit that. So we make our turn to hit that straightaway that gives us a nice final runway to land. So gears down, flaps are takeoff for now. Uh, let's put the flaps to landing, below 122. And now we're trying to set up just, like I'm looking at just checkpoints along the ground to get this airplane set up to be on a nice straightaway, like 12 to 1500 feet of straightaway and like 150 feet above the ground. And about 90 knots right here. So here we go. Setting this up pretty nice, so I'm just kind of adjusting my turn. A little bit more turn here. 500. Set up 500 feet, yaw dampers off, checklist is complete. So you see that? We got like a nice long straightaway. And so now what we're going to do is just point at the numbers. Gears checked down, I got three green lights, flaps are landing, checklist is complete. So we're just going to kind of like hold this. We're a little bit high, but I feel good. I'd rather be high than low. Little circle. We're Don't let go of the controls, you're going to land this thing. <laughs> like, you're going to land this thing. I'm just holding on. <laughs> uh, you're going to work with me. You can ride the control. So there we go. It's a little slow. I'm going to add a little bit of power right there. And now we just want to kind of keep the nose at the numbers until it disappears. And then we're going to just kind of like level the aircraft out. So this is like level right here. So now we just Air pull back speed. and pull back. There we go. Oh. We did it. We'll take it all the way down instead of... And I have negative... I have like this beta, which is negative thrust. Like reverse thrust to slow us down. Yeah, I feel good now. Flaps are up. Heat's off. We'll just taxi down. How was that? All right. Uh, how can people find more about you if they want to get in touch with you, get you to, to talk to them about some virtual events? Uh, how can they reach out to you or get in touch with you guys or follow you? Yeah, super easy. The easiest way is sagehub.com, and that'll give you all the details on us and our own virtual live event that teaches you how to run your own virtual live event. Okay, so sagehub.com, S-A-G-E-H-U-B.com, and we'll put the link in the description. All right, Barry Baumgartner, thank you, and Blue Melnick in the back. It was cool flying with you. I wish you guys brought Rosie, but it was cool with just the <laughs> two of you. Uh, how'd you guys, did you guys have fun? Amazing. Awesome. It really was. Like, I mean, you're, first of all, an incredible interviewer and uh, so much fun to hang out with you any day with you in a plane. Yeah. It's special, isn't it? It's special. It is.